Big breaking news. The Browns finally hiring a general manager. My expectation for everybody in this room is to come to work with a positive attitude and energy. A lot has certainly changed since Mike Mayock did become the general manager. Bill O'Brien is their general manager. He got that title today. All right, Patrick, when I said everyone who is anyone who is here, I meant the GM of the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> My job as a general manager is to deal with the business side, to be the strong liaison between football operations and the owner of the team. So as the ownership calls, you answer a lot of questions. Does the coach know what he's doing? Is he using the players properly? We're not good enough in a certain position. Why not? Got to be ready to answer those questions. Many of us are hired really based on your evaluation skills. You know, usually as you come up the ladder through scouting. But it's funny, once you get to become a general manager, it's not really a scouting job. It's really more of a leadership job. You know, you hire really talented people and you kind of give them a vision. This is what we're looking for, set the expectations. You know, you let them do their work and then take in information and make decisions. I kid my wife, once we start training camp, the next day off I'll probably take is after the draft. We're talking about everything from how we want to paint the field, to the color of socks we're going to wear, to the mouth guards we're going to use, to the massive contracts on Julio Jones and Matt Ryan and pro acquisitions from other teams. Patriots willing to give up a second round pick to get Mohamed Sanu. One time I signed a replacement defensive lineman during the game. We're doing 20, 25 contracts at the same time. Yeah, you ready to be a Minnesota Viking? It's organized chaos. There is nothing like the euphoria of competition at this level. This is what I do it for, man! So I break our season up into phases, and our phase starts with training camp. We're getting ready for a season, which is, of course, incredibly important. Get yourself in some shape, that's on you, not me. July to the end of August. The number one priority a general manager has at that time is to evaluate his team. Beginning of this whole process, we start with 90 players and we cut down to 53. I think the most difficult part of this job is making those final decisions on who's going to be on your 53 because there's a lot of very tough decisions and a lot of it may have to do with business only. Both Dan and myself spent hours and hours pouring over video and discussions and, and reports from not only our coaching staff but our scouting staff to determine how we're truly going to put our 53-man roster together. There are a lot of players that you want to keep and a lot of players that are evolving and we think that they can continue to grow but we don't have an opportunity to keep them around because 53, it seems like a lot of players until you're actually picking. Let's go! We gotta put the best football team on the field. Everyone knows that, you know? No one's gliding around here thinking they have things signed, sealed, and delivered. As you know, yes, sir. we've gotta cut our roster down. Yes, sir. We're gonna have to release you today. I know you've uh, put your heart, soul into this. And you played well. So I understand why it's tough. Yeah. I know the night before we get down to the 53, I'm usually staring at the ceiling all night, sleeping on a couch because I can't sleep. The thing that I probably hate the most about this job is to sit there and talk to each individual player that come in that I know we're going to have to release. You never know, you may be in the coaching side of this one day in your life, so uh, we may run into each other on that side too. Yeah. Especially if it's a veteran that has played here, has done everything we've asked both on the field and off the field, but it's time. Coach always had the final say where I was, but it was always collaborative. Head coaches get blamed when you're six and five, certainly when the owner's your general manager providing talent like he has. You're telling him to motivate him, to discipline him, to get him to play together. I didn't want somebody in that room thinking they could come to me and save their job. You go to the coach, you save your job. We also pick who we think are the most suitable for us to be on our practice squad. And the practice squad is a very important part of our team. They may not be making the same amount of money, but they're a really important part of not only developing themselves while they're on the practice squad, but also helping to develop our 53-man roster. Ron Wolf did this in Green Bay. The last three positions, 51, two, and three were fluid. He wanted to rotate those things, roll them through all the time. That gives you a chance of picking up some players. During the season, I like that idea. I'm so emotional about this game. 
A hundred years in the NFL. What a place to start. What a place to be. No for the kickoff. question about it. 100th anniversary of the National Football League, and very few venues bring it like they bring it here in Minnesota. That caps it off and makes it official. It's time to play football. September to December, that's the football season. So, so what do we do during the season? Once the season starts, there's not a lot of impact type moves that you can make on a roster. Maybe making a trade or two, but there's not a lot of specific trades that go on during the season, unlike other professional sports. From the beginning of the season all the way through the season, it is all about team building. It is all about culture and continuing to create what is necessary for us to be a championship organization. You kind of get into a little bit of a routine. I like to also watch the opponent look at some of their upcoming potential unrestricted free agents and what the free agency market is going to look like. We had a list ready every week, the best players available at each position and the best young players on each practice squad if we wanted to have them for the future. On game day, I have no say in anything, how we're going to blitz the quarterback, on what type of deep balls we're going to throw to Julio or what type of screens we're going to run. We do work hand in hand with the coaches establishing the roster each week. If we have injured players, working with the personnel department, making transactions to get you prepared to play on Sundays, game planning and all that stuff is all done by the coaches. You know, the coaches are working, obviously the players are playing. Um, so watching is a little difficult because you really can't be a part of it. I sit there with my hands tied and if I do call down to the sideline, We've all seen what happens there. GM Ray Farmer has been suspended without pay, all for those text messages he sent from his skybox to the sidelines last season. We flow through the season where things are really busy, not only looking at the personnel that we may be acquiring, but also evaluating how we are as a team, you know, currently. When the season is truly finished, and our games are through, we continue to build, and we continue to look at how we're gonna improve our football team. Ready? All right. So. Sign right here. Our number one priority going into the offseason was to solidify the quarterback position. Very excited to announce that we were able to finalize the deal on Kirk Cousins. The pro department has to start their meetings in January to get prepared for a free agency period. So we formulate our plan for free agency after the season, after we've had these meetings. Let's agree on what our needs are, on what players do we want back, and what players don't we want back that are under contract bridging what personnel has said, what the coaches have said. Now they're not going to have always a full understanding on how all those financial pieces are going to fit. Before free agency, there was no salary cap and I did 90% of the negotiations as general manager. Free agency came, a salary cap came. We needed to have somebody to oversee the salary cap and the contract negotiations. As you evaluate players and evaluate veteran players, you have to make sure that their performance level moving forward is equal to what their pay will be. You can't pay a player for what he used to be. You have to pay him for what they're going to be. You have to be very conscientious of our cap management when you do specific deals. The Minnesota Vikings agreeing to a four-year contract extension with Adam Thielen that includes $35 million guaranteed. And how it's not only going to affect you this year, but how it's going to affect your roster two, three years down the road. Once you get through those periods and you get ready for the uh, combine, which is probably the most critical off-season event that we attend. Preparing for the draft as a general manager is, is busy, but it's a year-long process, right? Our scouts start off providing me with information probably 13 months before uh, we even draft these players. We had last year, I think, 95 people involved in the combine in the draft process. We're not only talking about building our draft board, we're talking about the character issues that may be out there, elements of intelligence that we're trying to discern. We weed through all of that, build our draft board, the initial stages of our draft board, and then we go out into the bowl games and the all-star season, and we start looking at players in that, in that setting when they're, when they're truly competing against some of the best against the best. You're attending the East-West game, you're attending the Senior Bowl, hopefully uh, you're still in the playoffs. There are interruptions for the playoff games and for the Super Bowl, and obviously you don't mind those interruptions. You know, the Senior Bowl doesn't change dates just because your team's in the playoffs or not in the playoffs, along with the other things. So from a personnel standpoint, our first draft meetings are in December and they'll always be in December. I continue to get back reports 
from our scouting group all the way up until December when we have our first set of draft meetings, which is a very important time for us when we're evaluating the initial stages of building our draft board. The month of February, we had our draft meetings to go through uh, all the players who will be uh, in Indianapolis. Everything from background information, what we learned during the All-Star Game season, what the scouts saw during the fall. So there's a lot of uh, several weeks that go into the back-end organization before we even you know, move to Indianapolis. This is the first time that we have an extended period to actually have our coaching staff uh, sit with these guys, talk with these guys, uh, and really um, engage in good football conversations with these prospects. Who's the best quarterback you played for at OU? Baker. <laughs> All right, there we go. Smart man. The month of March, uh, a lot of us are out on the road going to these pro days, um, getting prepared for the draft, and then once April circles around, uh, we come together as a coaching staff and as a personnel staff and start uh, having our draft meetings to make final preparations for that big weekend. Good evening, Nashville. Welcome to the 2019 NFL Draft. The Arizona Cardinals are on the clock. Draft day. We had everybody in the draft. We had the scouts. We had the coaches. If the owner chose to come, which he did in Houston, I invited anybody in the organization. Hey, come on in. We never had a problem with information leaking. First of all, most staff, they get so bored, they don't want to stay. They go, okay? God, this thing is like watching grass grow. Day one can be a little slow till you're close to getting on the clock, depending on where you're picking. But hopefully, you're going to be able to pick an impact player that can have an impact on your roster. Man, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the most fascinating process, I think, out of any professional sports because everybody that you're drafting is expected to make an immediate impact. It's not like they're going to a minor league or they're going to do this or going to do that. That's where I feel like general managers really thrive. It's, of course, we love watching the games during the fall, but again, we can't do much during the fall. If you're the general manager, can you go to ownership and say, remember those, those draft picks I gave up? That's admitting remember, a big mistake. Remember I told you that this coach needed right. to be hired right. so we could attach him to the hip yeah. of this quarterback. Forget all that. So let's talk about draft date. How do you handle a trade there? Well, it's risk versus reward. You have to look at who's available when you pick, what your options might be, what another team is offering, how far we have to go back, what we can accumulate, those players as well compared to the player that we could get. And we spent a lot of time talking about it. There has been a trade involving this uh, fifth pick in the draft. The New Orleans Saints are now on the clock. We started off in the fifth position. Ricky Williams was the player that New Orleans Saints wanted. They, I believe, were in 12. Finally, we negotiated a trade with them, which started weeks before the draft, to say that they would give us their entire draft. Nine o'clock that morning, we formulated the trade if Williams was gonna be there. Well, we went through the draft, and all of a sudden, Williams was there. I wanted to find a way, could we move back up? The only team that would move was the Chicago Bears. They wanted Cade McDowell. I was able to convince them Cade McNow would be available at 11 or 12. So we. Got a trade semi done. We get on the clock at five. Ricky Williams is there. Saints, uh, we consummate the deal with them. Rams are picking six. They take Torrey Holt wide receiver. Champ Bailey's on the clock. That's the guy we want. He was the number one player on the board. So we have a, a trade already set with Chicago. I call Chicago. Well, we got to have another third round pick in this thing. Well, I'm mad now. Now you got two options. You tell them where they can go or you make the deal. The Redskins traded to the Bears, the uh, New Orleans Saints first round pick, as well as third round pick in this year's draft, Washington's fourth and fifth round picks in this year's draft, as well as a third round pick in the next year's draft. With the seventh pick, the Washington Redskins select Champ Bailey, defensive back, University of Georgia. We got the guy we wanted, we got the trade done. Ultimately, Bailey went to the Hall of Fame, so uh, it was worth it to make that trade. Garrett. Rick Spielman, yeah. how you doing, bud? You know, you get different reactions when you call these kids. Just want to tell you that you were one of my favorite players this year, and uh, and you're going to be a Baltimore Raven. It's great because now a lot of them are either in the green room or they have cameras in their homes or wherever they're having their draft party. So I'm this out. <laughs> And when you talk to those kids and you hear the joy. Big Jeb, what's up, man? How we doing? I'm doing great. How y'all doing? We're going to make you a brown here. Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all. 
they've earned that right to say that they were an NFL draft pick. As you start getting later in the draft rounds and you call these, these kids, some of these kids have been sitting around for hours and hours and days feeling really bad about themselves and, and they've had parties and the parties have dissipated, right? And all of a sudden there's only like two or three of them left and you can hear how disappointed they are. And it's your first chance of really having an opportunity to help bring them along and encourage them that, look, there's a long road ahead of you here, whether you're drafted in the sixth round or the sixth overall pick. And the craziest part of the whole weekend is right after the draft and trying to sign 20 college free agents. And it's no holds bar. Everybody's calling the same top guys. If you're trying to find, sign a receiver and one guy's kind of iffy, well, you're working three other receivers at the same time. Favorite part, of course, is on draft day. Of course, is preparing to build the team and make this the best team. Besides the game days on Sundays or whether you're playing during the week, draft day is what GMs live for. It is also the euphoria of game day. I mean, I think you could be in another business and it could be exciting from, from day to day and, and event to event within a business, but there is nothing like, you know, the euphoria of competition at this level. I've been on a team somewhere since I was probably eight years old until now which I think is pretty cool. I love, I love that part of it. Being on a team, um, you work towards a common goal. The most fun thing for me as a general manager was, was, was signing a player or drafting a player and seeing the player go on and develop. That's the way to run that thing. Brian Mitchell. He was a quarterback at Southwest Louisiana, an option quarterback. Great statistics. Go to a college all-star game in Houston in the Astrodome. He didn't play a lot, but he practiced. And he's practicing running back, and I saw him catching balls out of the backfield. I said, you know, this guy, this guy might have something to him. Our running back coach, Don Bro, went down and worked him out. Hey, we ought to take this guy. We're sitting there in the fifth round, got the last pick in the fifth round of my first draft. Brian Mitchell's up on the board. Hey, let's go with this guy. There's no way that we knew, okay, that Brian Mitchell would become the all-time leader in kick return yardage for the National Football League, and second to Jerry Rice in total yards. He played seven more seasons. You gotta be scratching and biting and fighting, baby, and I'm willing to do all three of them. Those are the things that get you excited about a general manager. Finding a player, and then seeing him develop and grow into a, a starter or an excellent player. Got a lot of stories like that, but Brian Mitchell might be one of the more unique ones. I really have a strong feeling that, you know, the, the NFL GM is evolving for sure. Football technology, for instance, uh, I, I have a strong belief in that. And I believe any general manager within the league that is going to continue to be successful needs to be at least cognizant of being on the front end of the curve. I think the way that players learn is totally different than it was even 10 years ago, whether it's the millennials or Generation Z, they learn different. You just can't put a big playbook. So I think part of the responsibility of the organization is as players come in, we have to individually understand how each player learns. I think also the mental health is a huge thing that is continuing to grow. You should not be ashamed if you're having mental health issues to reach out and get help. To me, I always looked at it as like if you had a sprained ankle, you're gonna go see a doctor. If you're having something, whatever, from a mental health, go see the expert to get it fixed. We have to be very open-minded to evolving as a sport, and I think we are. I think we have a, a lot of very intelligent people who are not anywhere near as myopic as they used to be, all due respect to older generations in this business. We have to be very open-minded. We have to understand that all of this technology is gonna supplement a head coach while he's facing his opposition, and, and, and for a general manager who's open-minded to use all of this technology we have to make sure that we're not only picking the best players, but keeping the best players on our team and preparing our players in the best way through athletic performance and all we're doing technology-wise there so that we can have the best players on the field.